more or more local roads. Uh, but uh, um, Okay, uh, so uh, with that, uh, you can see that we have the location of the bridges. Uh, we break down the bridges into um, uh, steel and concrete bridges. And the idea is that there would be having different vulnerabilities in the flooding events. Uh, we also have the distribution, uh, spatial distribution of the uh, traffic. You can see some parts of the state uh, or the district are uh, pretty, uh, have high uh, traffic. Accordingly, they have also higher capacity as well. So all of these are integrated into the uh, modeling scheme that we have. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to uh, first start with introducing a general uh, resilience framework that I normally use and kind of is implemented in such a way that can, uh, um, can be applied in uh, different contexts and different hazards. I actually call it a multi-hazard resilience assessment framework, which basically is uh, consisting of a hazard characterization, uh, basically component, which looks into uh, the hazard, the type of the hazard, frequency or intensity measures uh, that are associated with that hazard. It has an exposure identification where we understand uh, what is the uh, likelihood of different assets or components of our infrastructure system that can be exposed and what are the attributing factors for that exposure. We have asset vulnerability measures that there are different ways that one can uh, measure the vulnerability. One of the more famous ones are the fragility functions. And uh, from there, uh, we can set up a resilience assessment, which basically covers uh, two components. One is the risk assessment component, which uh, basically we would like to understand the impact of an individual um, asset on the performance of the infrastructure system uh, in terms of both uh, direct damages and also <clears throat> potential cascade effects. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the more important part which defines resilience is really the recovery part where uh, uh, not only uh, we are interested in the immediate aftermath of the event, but we are also looking into the temporal evolution of the uh, various performance measures that we consider for the system and how they evolve as uh, we are trying to recover from the system. And uh, then uh, all of this kind of forms a, a computational backbone uh, that uh, kind of establishes this framework. And then at the end of the day, what we really want to do with this computational backbone is to be able to do uh, decision making, to uh, make decisions. These de decisions are either uh, pre-event decisions in terms of mitigation or post-event for recovery or a combination of both. Uh, they can be short or long-term uh, decisions. Um, short-term short decisions can be things such as emergency response or deploying your uh, uh, maintenance crew and such, or medium ones are uh, things such as um, uh, repairing and dam the, the damages and the long-term planning is more of a, you know, how to make this uh, uh, more resilient into for uh, future events. And the hope is that this decision-making finally uh, is going to impact your exposure conditions, for example, uh, with um, creation of, in the case of flooding event, creation of catch basins, you're preventing the flooding to happen to some of your assets, or you might, uh, for example, create some mitigation uh, for some of the assets that may result in enhancing their kind of, uh, pre pre or reducing their vulnerability to that extreme event. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course, you, you may end up doing some sort of planning for uh, future events that will help with the recovery uh, in, in the face of future events. So that's kind of the general framework we're going to work with. So moving forward from this one, uh, let's look into this context that we are looking for, uh, the characterization of the hazards. Uh, here, what we have in mind is uh, basically what we have is uh, the, the five different basins that could result in flooding. Uh, uh, we also uh, have uh, different return periods uh, or basically probability of occurrence of these events. Uh, the, uh, the basically intensity measure of interest in this uh, case of flood 
flood events, what we are looking for is flood water depth. Uh, uh, and also, uh, in, in a sense, the, uh, the boundary of flooding events. So uh, this is something that was uh, given to us by our uh, the state of Iowa Flood Center, uh, located in uh, University of Iowa. The hydrologists had conducted uh, the uh, scenarios there, and we were given about more than 800 scenarios to work with. So that's basically our hazard characterization that we're going to uh, work with. Uh, the next item is uh, the exposure identification. Uh, basically, we need to uh, um, have an understanding of the exposure of these different component. Uh, this only this not only requires our uh, geographic location of these assets, but also an understanding of the features of these assets that make them vulnerable to this hazard of uh, this target hazard, which in this case is flooding. And um, um, uh, so uh, we have the locations, we have a uh, location of the roadways, uh, we have the uh, topography of this state uh, as to uh, what is the elevation of different uh, assets. Uh, we also had access to uh, all the plans, um, the design era, condition state of the assets and so on and so forth. So that was kind of a, I would say in a sense, um, uh, a, a, a lucky situation that we had the luxury of this type of data. There's a chance that uh, in some of the uh, infrastructure systems that are more proprietary in nature, such as electric grid lines is another area that I work on, uh, such uh, asset information is not uh, available in those cases, obviously, uh, other types of approaches such as use of proxy indicators, you know, um, kind of um, surveys, aerial imagery and stuff like that uh, can be used. Uh, but in this case, since we had the elevation of the assets, as can be shown here, uh, uh, we uh, also have had communications with the state engineers as to, you know, what are the conditions for closure of different assets. And based on that, we defined exposure <clears throat> thresholds uh, for these uh, uh, components of infrastructure. Uh, after that, we would like to measure uh, the vulnerability of the assets. Uh, for this one, we actually conducted an extensive overview review of uh, the different type of uh, um, damages that had occurred because of um, uh, uh, historical flood events in the state. Uh, we were able to review more than 1,000 uh, damage, uh, detailed damage reports uh, on infrastructure that were damaged mostly. Uh, there were about 95% of them about uh, either roadways or bridges. We were able to categorize the type of damages that are uh, seen uh, in these type of uh, um, uh, assets. And um, from there, uh, uh, we were able to also characterize the likelihood of the damage given the intensity measure, which is the flooding stage in this case, uh, and develop empirical fragility functions. This is a very recent work that is coming out in uh, bridge engineering. Uh, at the time that we were conducting this um, um, uh, network analysis, we had not developed the um, fragility functions yet. So we considered something called the bridge performance indicator, which is basically a, a combination of uh, the condition state of the bridge, which would be representing the, uh, 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 the vulnerability of the bridge to the flood event uh, and uh, has in, in, in it a, a number of different things, such as um, uh, the important of the bridge and also the age of the bridge. So we use that for uh, the vulnerability measure of a target that we used uh, in our uh, bridges. Uh, we also, from the data that we had, uh, we uh, understood that uh, from the damages, the previous or historical damages, we noted that the more than there are 33 bridges that are very likely to uh, be damaged in um, hazards uh, in in these flood events, and uh, we were able to measure uh, these are the uh, IDs or identification numbers of these bridges in our program, uh, and their locations are kind of the 33 bridges are shown and they're spread out different states, uh, in different uh, parts of the uh, district, and also uh, we can measure what is the water level for different uh, uh, for different return periods or uh, probabilities of occurrence of the flooding events. Uh, the color code that, uh, uh, the kind of uh, cells here also show that which, uh, which um, river basin or flooding in which river basin would be uh, the cause of that damage. Uh, so with that uh, information, uh, we would like now to go and uh, kind of do the first stage of our resilience uh, assessment, which is basically assessment of the risk because of these flooding events. Uh, 
Uh, for that, what we have is obviously uh, the information for our hazards, uh, the information for our assets and their exposure, and then we conducted flood simulations. And uh, brought, based on that, we could measure, um, you know, different things such as what would be damaged, what would be closed, what would be the loss of connectivity, what is the traffic delay associated with those closures, what are the losses of opportunity because of those closures, and so on and so forth. And each one of them, what you can see is one performance measure for the network. And uh, reality is that if you look into, one looks into the literature of um, resilience assessment or enhancement, there, there is no concurrence on as to which the performance measure is the best performance measure. And in fact, in our study, uh, we saw that necessarily, um, uh, you know, all of them do not do not point into the same conclusion. So it, it, it may be that uh, one case that one bridge uh, has a really high uh, direct damage uh, costs because of the type of the bridge that is there. Uh, but one, if one calculates the uh, uh, indirect costs associated with that bridge, they're not that much compared to another one. Uh, so one of the things that we did uh, in our risk assessment, we uh, kind of proposed, that, proposed a multi-scale risk index, which is kind of showed in this radial chart. And uh, the idea is that uh, we calculate, assuming that uh, the bridge, uh, the, the network in, is in its intact condition, uh, would be the blue lines, and one can calculate the area under there. And uh, then the, uh, uh, when the network is damaged, uh, the, these different performance measures are going to decrease uh, or uh, kind of deteriorate because of that um, extreme event that happened. And then one can calculate the area under the red chart, and that would be some sort of an indicator of severity of uh, the event or uh, the criticality uh, of the infrastructure assets versus uh, those events. And uh, that was one study that we conducted to provide a more holistic uh, understanding of uh, risk assessment and the performance measures that need to be accounted for when, when one does risk assessment. Another thing that we did with this uh, framework was uh, to develop risk curves. These risk curves are a very useful tool, especially for the decision makers to understand uh, what type of you know, uh, risk are they are willing to take and what that means in terms of um, a kind of annual uh, exceedance probability and the associated cost with that uh, in different scenarios of uh, kind of extreme uh, flooding events happening in different basins. And one can set this up in different contexts. Uh, we uh, did it for direct costs and also total costs, which was a combination of direct and total costs, but other kind of performance measures can be calculated depending on what the decision maker uh, wants in terms of uh, a performance measure to make decisions on. Um, now, another aspect, as I mentioned, uh, which is very important is um, uh, uh, in the notion of resilience, we are not interested in the immediate aftermath of the event, but also looking at the, that temporal evolution of uh, this metric that we are interested in. As I mentioned, that metric can vary, uh, but one can kind of um, uh, follow that metric and see what kind of evolution is happening um, uh, um, uh, during the time after the extreme event. And this is obviously not a trivial task uh, to model at all. Uh, there are uh, aspects such as, you know, um, the limited data that we have on restoration tasks, specifically the complexities that we have with uh, the emergency nature of uh, the um, kind of restoration and recovery and repair, uh, impact, impact of, you know, accessibility and resource scarcity that can kind of Im uh, impede uh, the uh, recovery actions. Uh, we have addressed this in different ways. Uh, we have conducted a historical event restoration, uh, uh, kind of a uh, study on the historical event restoration data through those uh, more than 1,000 uh, damaged, uh, detailed damage record data that I mentioned. Uh, so we were able to find out uh, for different types of damages that uh, were likely to happen, what kind of, um, uh, um, what kind of uh, activities are taken, uh, normally what, how much they cost. And uh, then we surveyed the infrastructure owners and also the contractors that were uh, responsible for these um, recovery and repair actions to um, see how, how long they took to complete. Uh, we also use uh, methods such as cri critical path methods to kind of model uh, that cost and time and so on and so forth. 
Uh, and uh, with all this information, uh, one ha can have a better understanding of, you know, how to model that recovery and what are the constraints that one needs to put into that recovery med model. Uh, having all of that uh, put together, as I mentioned, uh, a, a, an important por part now is that now that we can model all these aspects as uh, close as we can uh, with, uh, with close to reality um, kind of assumptions, uh, how, how are we going to go about and make decisions based on, uh, based on these parameters? Uh, and uh, so if uh, we look into the famous resilience curve uh, where we have the system functionality versus time, uh, we normally have a, a shock event or an extreme event, which results in deterioration of that um, system functionality, however that we define it. And then after that, uh, it may take us some time depending on how, um, um, Plan, how much plans we have, how much access we have to the damage assets and so on and so forth. We start the recovery process that is gonna take some time and hopefully we're gonna get to what we were in, this, in terms of the system functionality before the event or even into better conditions. Uh, now, uh, one of the aspects is that uh, one can prepare for such event. Uh, one can prepare for such event by enhancing the characteristics of uh, the assets uh, that could be vulnerable to that event in such a way that they're in a better state. Uh, and as such, when that event happens in future, uh, their loss in functionality will be lower. But at the same time, uh, if we have uh, plans in place, which uh, allows us to have um, a faster uh, repair, uh, for example, contracts in place or, um, um, or uh, just um, uh, simply um, using more accelerated techniques, uh, we're gonna have a faster recovery. If we, our plans are uh, very well laid out, we hopefully are gonna get to even better um, uh, conditions after the event and use that as a window of opportunity in a sense. Now, uh, there are some issues with that kind of a decision making. It's a very complex phenomenon. And uh, a part, a large part of it is that uh, we have a huge uncertainty right at the first stage when we are making a decision as to what we need to mitigate. What are the assets that we need to mitigate? Uh, we don't have, and the reason for that is that we have no knowledge of uh, what event is going to happen. That's completely uncertain to us. And uh, uh, and the, the second part of it is that uh, whatever decision that we make as to what to mitigate is going to impact how the system is going to perform after such event happens or another event happens or another kind of scenario. So uh, in a sense, uh, there's some sort of a loop in this decision making. What, uh, what you mitigate is going to impact how your system performs. And as such, uh, the best mitigation strategy may not be as obvious at the beginning uh, because that secondary effects and uh, kind of post-event response needs to be accounted for. And obviously, uh, again, uh, when you uh, when a specific event happens, so the scenario is clear, and you're looking into your second stage, there are many paths as to what to uh, repair and what to recover, and which one to do first, so that we have a faster recovery. And that's and again another problem that needs to be accounted for. So inherently, this is a nonlinear model if we wanted to do some sort of an optimization on it. So what we have done in this study is uh, we have developed a two-stage stochastic pro uh, uh, programming method or nonlinear two-stage programming method that basically handles nonlinear problems. It handles uh, the interaction that is existent and is natural to do to the, to the two stages that we have before and after event. It captures the time evolution of the system operation after the event and deals with the uncertain parameters and finds the solutions. It has two stages, first stage and second stage. And the first stage basically represents, for example, in this case, bridge mitigation to increase the network capacity. And the second stage is the set of post-event recovery actions at different um, flooding scenarios. So, 
uh, with that, let's take a look, quick look into, uh, I would say, uh, boiled down simplistic uh, view of what this uh, two stage uh, stochastic programming is. The first stage in, uh, includes basically the objective is to minimize uh, the general ob objective of this formulation is to minimize the costs and consequences associated with mitigating and also responding to disruption of the network. So again, that notion of first and second stage is really there. Uh, the first stage is about you know, uh, what you're going to mitigate, what is the cost with that. It's uh, understanding that when you're mitigating something or uh, kind of uh, um, at doing some sort of a construction on a bridge, uh, to improve its uh, features against flood, there's going to be some traffic delay associated with that. But then also understanding the fact that uh, whatever mitigation you do, obviously you're not going to be 100% perfect. You're not going to implement the um, a mitigation on every single uh, asset that needs mitigation. As such, there's going to be some sort of an expected exposed cost, which is coming from the second stage. And again, the second stage, the idea is that um, uh, there's uh, some costs associated with this recovery of the assets. There's some traffic delay costs and also the opportunity costs associated with that. And um, so this is basically the NTSSP formulation we have. Again, uh, there's some constraints to this, um, uh, just again, boiling it down in a in more um, kind of um, easier way. Uh, reality is that we do not have all the budget to mitigate and uh, every single structure uh, before the event. Some part of it is because of our uh, restraint resources, but also because of the uncertainty associated with the event. So uh, there's a mitigation budget that, that needs to be assigned. Uh, basically, we consider the actual state of the bridge with that BP or bare bridge performance index, uh, whatever uh, bridge that has a lower than 70% BPI is going to be eligible for mitigation. Doesn't mean it's going to be mitigated, but it's eligible. Uh, we can use either cons uh, conventional construction or accelerated bridge construction, which is a faster, more expensive approach. Uh, and during the mitigation, because it's not emergent conditions, we're going to have um, partial closure. So we're going to allow traffic to follow, but there might be some traffic. And uh, again, um, bridge performance is going to uh, improve step by step every 30 days. In the second stage, there's no limitation on the budget. The idea is that whatever that gets damaged is going to be fixed. Uh, the and then uh, obviously the bridge damage is associated with the assumptions we had or correlated with the flood depth. So the more the flood depth, the more likely the bridge is gonna be damaged. Whatever bridge performance index after flooding that is lower than 50% should be recovered or repaired. Uh, again, you can use either conventional or accelerated bridge construction. Uh, the assumption is that because of the damage and because of the existence of the flooding for the first one third of the recovery time, this asset is gonna be closed. So there's not gonna be any traffic on it, but then it's going to be gradually opened for the remainder of the two thirds of the time of the project. So with that information, we have kind of set up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the framework for that NTSSP. Now, the question is that how are we going to go and solve this? Uh, it's a very uh, hard problem. Uh, it's impractical to find a solution method with an accurate optimum to fit all of the problems we have. What are the problems? Uh, we have an NP, a nonlinear convex traffic assignment problem, uh, which uh, uh, needs to be cyclically kind of checked uh, 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 to kind of represent that evolution of time uh, that we were talking about. There's a mixed integer construction resource allocation problem also hidden in it at the middle level, uh, which requires a lot of uh, con computational time. And then uh, on top of all of it, it's a stochastic problem, uh, programming problem because there's a lot of uncertainty with your flooding. Uh, and uh, on top of all of these uh, uh, those uh, these um, complexities, we have our application environment is a real network, real world, large scale transportation network. So what we have adopted here is an evolution strategy. Uh, basically, um, uh, uh, the idea is that the population of random resource allocation strategies compete in cost. Um, uh, that leads to a survival selection. And then the smaller cost is the better. And then the better strategies are chosen to produce next round candidate strategies and compete again. And after a few rounds, there's a possibility of creating a solution that fits the minimum cost objective of that NTSSP problem. So that's kind of how it's done. 
but as I mentioned, one of the major problems here is that in your first state mitigation analysis, uh, there, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what type of, of flooding event is going to happen. And in this case, uh, we had about 800 scenarios of flooding. So uh, the question is that for each, each mitigation strategy, we need to be able to run, uh, you know, what are, what are the potential recoveries after each type of the scenario or floods that could happen. Uh, we conducted that, we used uh, basically um, high performance, a message passing interface within a high performance computing system, which basically uh, all the possible scenarios would be given, uh, and then it would be broken down to different and um, uh, all, the, all the mitigation scenarios would be given to the system and then uh, it would be broken down uh, for each um, flood scenario and then it would be running for the whole time to capture that evolution and then passing it back uh, to the nodes so that it could make a decision as to uh, how uh, the, which, uh, which strategy is to be used. So with that uh, discussion on how um, how the modeling and how this uh, um, computational framework and the optimization framework works. Let's uh, take a look at some of the results. Uh, first, uh, we have no uh, ex ante or pre event or mitigation investment. So let's say we are going uh, with the system as is, uh, not changing anything before the event. So we are starting at about a system functionality. And this system functionality here is representative equal to the bridge performance. But as I mentioned again, one can select different system functionality. Functionalities. But here, the results I'm showing are based on bridge performance. Uh, it's going to be constant, no change to it. And then extreme event happens, and there's, there can be a drop in its capacity, uh, uh, either between 40 to 58%. The idea is to get to 63% at the least. And uh, what the program comes in is an expected recovery cost at the second stage of 392.9, uh, which 36.8 of it is direct costs associated with repairing those structures, and then the rest of it is indirect costs. Now, uh, here uh, I'm showing different investment scenarios uh, in terms of mitigation again, uh, 15, 25, 35, and 45. Uh, I'm also showing which bridges the uh, program selected to have accelerated construction versus conventional construction. In each one of them, one of the things that you can see is that the number of the uh, bridges that are selected for extra, uh, accelerated construction technique for the repair uh, process uh, increases with the investment, which is an expected approach because investment is increasing. So it's reducing the time and impact on the network. So it's actually a good approach to take. So here um, uh, with a $15 million, for example, investment, as a constraint, uh, what, what I can say is that program is not using the whole $15 million. It's only using about $12 million of it for the investment. So that's the best uh, result that it's getting from it. You can see the capacity of the system is being enhanced uh, uh, as it is moving uh, towards the mitigation. Uh, and then uh, and then extreme event happens. Uh, obviously, uh, the functionality of the system uh, decreases, but not as much as no investment. So the mitigation works. Uh, and then um, obviously recovery happens. The expected value of this recovery cost is about 200. So huge uh, decrement uh, compared to when you have no mitigation. And that's about 29.5 is direct cost and 179 about, uh, for, uh, for indirect costs. It also showing which bridge identification numbers, which bridges uh, are being fixed or mitigated with which construction technique, and also which bridges in the recovery side are going to be uh, kind of uh, uh, recovered and which, with which construction technique. So kind of gives that information to the decision maker as well. Uh, here, uh, let's uh, just take a look into, uh, in a sense, um, uh, uh, again, as I was mentioning, hopefully this works, it didn't work. Uh, so let's uh, uh, go back. Um, the time evolution of um, uh, these uh, changes, you can see different links and breaches here are going to be fixed. Uh, and then the flooding happens. And again, the recovery is taking place and uh, uh, different bridges are going to be fixed again. And that's kind of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the system evolution as it is happening. 
if one takes a look at the uh, kind of the costs, uh, if uh, one looks into the direct costs, again, we said we have different scenarios of investment for, uh, uh, for pre-event mitigation. Uh, again, not all of that is being used because uh, probably it's not resulting in the best solution. So whatever that we give, the program uses as much as it wants uh, for uh, the mitigation. And what we can see is that the enhancing or investing in the direct costs at the, uh, at the investment or pre-event uh, mitigation uh, results in decreasing uh, the direct costs associated with the recovery. Again, a very expected. Uh, indirect costs, you see the same similar trend. Uh, and uh, then when you look into the total cost, you can see that uh, after some time, uh, really there's not much difference for this specific system as to how much uh, one uh, invests on because uh, 25 million to 35 to 45, there's not much total cost save. And actually the Delta costs are showing here. So in fact, 25 million dollar uh, investment for this specific uh, uh, segments of the road with these scenarios is a very good investment to uh, to improve the uh, improve the um, resilience of the system in a sense in face of floods. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude uh, this part. Uh, what I've done, uh, obviously, is a simulation tool that captures not only system level vulnerabilities uh, to a suite of different hazards, but also the evolution after hazard happens. Uh, it uh, captures both um, uh, pre-event and post-event kind of um, decisions and the impact that they have and kind of the play that they have uh, across the decision making. We use capabilities of uh, uh, high performance companies computing. One of the aspects here was that we developed it in such a way that it has modularized codes. It's very easy to be used by um, practicing engineers or decision makers as well. And uh, again, it's general enough that can be implemented in different contexts uh, with, uh, for a multi-hazard resilience optimization tool. Uh, there are some opportunities obvious here, obviously here that one can consider uh, looking into, you know, portfolio of assets, considering co-location and resource sharing when the optimization is happening, that, that provides a more realistic restoration function. Uh, integrating uh, kind of uh, situational awareness uh, through, you know, citizen science and social media information and such uh, to enhance um, kind of that recovery and uh, expedite the recovery process. Uh, uh, uncertainty quantification uh, in, in different kind of um, different uh, um, steps of the problem so that we can kind of characterize and treat that uncertainty. And obviously looking into performance measures that are more connected to uh, community resilience to kind of highlight uh, that aspects of it. These are some of the aspects that are kind of uh, uh, currently we're working uh, as part of our uh, future upcoming work. Uh, we have also in our, our research group looked into uh, transportation infrastructure from other perspectives uh, under other hazards. Um, specifically uh, looking into that vulnerability assessment component, uh, developing uh, multi-hazard uh, fragility functions, either under SCAR and earthquake, microburst and earthquake. And the idea is that some of these hazards are um, uh, codependent, some of them are uh, interdependent, uh, independent, and as such, uh, that needs to be accounted for shock and aftershock, deterioration and earthquake, and so on and so forth. That's some of the work that we have done previously. Uh, we have also looked into uh, a similar system uh, conducting the risk assessment under uh, earthquake events, seismic events in uh, Los Angeles and Orange counties. That's uh, some of the work ha that has been done. And also uh, looking into this in the context of hurricane and storm surge. And actually, we developed the manual of uh, in the ASC manual of practice, uh, an approach that is a very um, uh, straightforward approach for um, kind of um, understanding the level of the resilience in the system in a kind of fast-paced approach. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to um, 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 thank uh, all of you, the audience, and also uh, uh, acknowledge the funding from all these funding agencies that has uh, supported our work in this area, specifically thanking also my uh, graduate students and undergraduate students that have helped with development of this work. Uh, and with that, I'm opening the floor for any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you very much, Alice, for this very comprehensive um, presentation. It also gives me the opportunity to uh, remind everyone uh, the fact that Eurostruct came from a cost action TU1406, uh, TU which was um, uh, quite heavily focused on the derivation of these performance indicators or key performance indicators as a means to standardization, which was the uh, let's see the aspect of that action that was carried through also to the Eurostruct Association. I think you touched upon that topic quite uh, um, a number of times in this presentation. Um, I would like, though, maybe to ask from uh, ask you or initiate from a question on that uh, point. And many of these indicators are perhaps not easy to quantify, um, and they come from maybe databases, as you mentioned at one point. They might come from assessments that have some level of uh, uh, bias because they are based on perception or inspection of individual experts. Others might come from quite refined uh, evaluation methods. Is there a way to optimally combine these indicators as you saw, for example, in the spider diagrams? There again, we can have information that comes from various sources and might reflect different qualities. How can one harmonize all of this information into key performance indicators? That's a very good question. Uh, in terms of the uh, the um, kind of those uh, radial charts that we have developed, they're actually coming from all from the same source. Uh, but I would agree with the fact that there are different methods to uh, kind of even computationally measure different performance indicators, and uh, there's uh, some level of uh, you know I would say uh, uncertainty associated with that how that modeling is happening, or if uh, one uses actual data, how uh, that needs to be accounted for, and. Uh, Obviously, there's uh, some ways, uh, uh, approaches or methodologies to kind of account for uh, that uncertainty associated with uh, that. Uh, in, uh, in the case of our case, however, um, uh, we used um, indicators that were coming all from the same model. In a sense, uh, in, uh, I, I would say um, if, uh, if, if there was some level of error associated with any of them, it was it was equal across in a sense uh, all of them so mm -hmm. so for the for the um uh, comparison purposes, which was uh, the ex the purpose of that those radial charts, it would serve the purpose. Uh, but if we were ap wanted to make absolute um, kind of uh, comparisons between this case and a completely different case from somewhere else, then one needed to definitely um, uh, account for uh, for some of the parameters that you mentioned, and um, uh, that that would make make the problem very complex. Mm. Maybe before um, I transfer uh, or ask Irina to chip in, I, I wanted to uh, ask or remind the audience to pose their questions always through the chat and we will uh, then transfer them to the speaker. So Irina, I don't know if you have a, a question. I have a question, yeah. So I have one question from the audience. Uh, the question is if uh, you have already considered to enlarge your analysis to include also other criteria for the optimization. Uh, more related to social and indirect economic consequences of transport network disruption. That's a very good question. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, we have uh, had uh, optimization uh, other parts of this study that have looked into um, uh, system functionality measures that are associated, for example, with indirect costs, uh, and uh, that indirect cost it in itself has uh, travels delay and also opportunity losses, uh, and. Um, um, uh, I, um, yeah, so for, for this pr specific presentation, I uh, try to focus this a little bit on the bridge side and the structure side, but uh, in a network context. But yes, uh, that it is possible uh, because uh, that's an output of our um, output of our computational framework, that risk assessment computational framework, and uh, can be used as, as the measure for, uh, for the optimization. Uh, as for uh, community resilience uh, measures, uh, as I mentioned, one, one study that we are currently conducting a major aspect uh, is uh, really accessibility after an extreme event and that evolution that happens in accessibility. Uh, one can also consider the demographics of the community. That's something that we are currently working on. Uh, and that would be, again, uh, a performance measure outcome of uh, the risk assessment uh, 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 computational module, uh, which uh, again, combined with the recovery models, uh, one can capture its evolution over time. Uh, and then um, uh, 
our idea here is to be able to kind of do as for the sake of decision makers some sort of a I would say color coded map of you know uh, which demographics would have less accessibility and how to improve that uh, in a sense and uh, kind of changing the constraints of the optimization but uh, yes it is possible to be uh, done uh, by this um, computational model and just quickly to continue the, the indirect consequences which you shown here I linked to the traffic disruption related to the bridge exactly uh, so these are uh, related to traffic delay uh, indirect cost combines traffic delay costs and also opportunity losses the idea is that because of the either elongated traffic time or because of the loss of um, uh, kind of uh, connection to other parts of the uh, network, uh, what we call isolation, uh, some trips will be lost and there's some uh, cost associated or some opportunities associated with those trips that are lost that needs to be accounted for and that's included in the indirect cost that we have calculated. Eleni, your turn. <laughs> yes, maybe to stay on the topic of optimization, there is one more question, uh, which I guess is, uh, um, well, I, I think it's more on the methodological side, but nonetheless probably uh, is, um, is an issue for many who attempt to do this kind of optimization or use this optimization scheme. So this is from Huang Bing Yang. He would like, to, or she would like to know if, uh, to ask how to obtain the optimum since uh, when using heuristic methods, we really can only generate a near optimal solution. And I guess this is the case, but then I suppose the real question is how to ensure that we, we have a solution that we can trust when using heuristics. Uh, that's a very good question. That's the pro problem with heuristic methods uh, or uh, uh, they're, uh, they, for, but uh, reality is that uh, simply for a problem like this, it would be very hard to come up with um, like the absolute optimal problem uh, with, with, for the exact reasons that I mentioned uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, uh, there are different ways we have um, tried to address this with um, kind of um, having different generations and had uh, different sizes of uh, optimization uh, space, uh, all of that, uh, and then kind of doing some sort of a sensitivity analysis, I would mm -hmm. say uh, that um, uh, that would provide an ideal of, you know, uh, whether these are close enough uh, optim to, to optimal solutions or not. Uh, but, but I can agree that uh, potentially if, run, if, if one changes the parameters or runs it uh, for a much longer uh, time, for much more generations, they may find other uh, more optimal solutions. The question here would be, you know, how much more optimal it would be and would, would it be uh, um, uh, worth the cost? Uh, the time uh, and computational costs. So that's really what comes, it comes down to in a heuristic uh, optimization. Maybe on that note, I can also um, ask the following. So for many of these optimization methods, we're discussing usually deterministic um, means to optimization, but uh, a lot of the aspects you have mentioned, of course, come with uncertainties. So in, in, in this case, uh, would it be possible to, um, or have you experimented with frameworks that take this into account? I guess a Bayesian framework would be a popular choice, uh, but there exist also other alternatives that somehow try to take into consideration this um, uh, uncertainty involved in, in these um, indicators or in these sources of information. In this specific study, we didn't necessarily use Bayesian methods, but in other, our other work uh, um, that we had a smaller network, um, what I call a, an educational network, we have used that and it was uh, um, it had a positive impact. In, in this network, simply it, it would be hard with any other method to mm. Uh, to come to that optimal. Uh, one, uh, one other approach we're considering is really database methods, but we haven't uh, uh, completed our studies to see whether they're like uh, computationally um, um, uh, uh, positive in that sense. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Irina, I give it over to Jan again. Oh, thanks. Uh, so we have a question from Matthias Pantelli. 
uh, about the, so did you apply this decision-making tools in a real world application? Or actually, yeah, my question would be, did you in some way validate the, the consequences and the resilience uh, predictions? And, uh, and how would uh, these uh, models could be combined or integrated with the traditional cost benefit analysis? Uh, so, uh, obviously, this is implemented in a real uh, life network. Uh, that, that, that's what we're proud of, <laughs> in a sense. Um, uh, in terms of uh, having the data to kind of um, uh, compare or validate these, uh, it's very hard. Uh, I, I doubt uh, anyone has that type of data. Uh, in the field for such a big network. Uh, so uh, our approach was really uh, to validate and verify different parts of the computational model. And as soon as we were fine with it, we were, uh, uh, we would move on to combining them. So that's, that's really uh, the way that we have gone about uh, validating these results. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, this is something that is going to be implemented by a real estate agency. So uh, that's, that's really how close it can get into be, being implemented. Uh, as for cost benefit analysis, yes, we actually have um, uh, another part of this study that uh, at, uh, looks into a smaller segment of the network and conducts cost benefit analysis. analysis. And um, uh, the reason uh, for looking into a smaller network was uh, just um, uh, because of the type of detailed data that was needed. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, uh, we, in a sense, dissected a portion of this network and looked into a specific set of assets that was actually presented to us as um, a set of assets that were uh, being flooded over and over on a year, on an annual basis, uh, and uh, to conduct benefit cost analysis as in terms of exactly mitigation studies as to, um, you know, whether it's worth to spend uh, so many million dollars in kind of raising the road segment or bridge segment to prevent overtopping or also damages. And uh, yeah, we have uh, used that in that context as well. Maybe on the topic of, you know, this information or this, the outcome of these methods used in a practical sense from, I don't know, real estate agencies or in other cases from roadway owners and agencies, is there a special care one needs to take in the way in which this information is translated into a usable outcome? Uh, is this a consideration you have to make? Uh, or is it, you know, is it, is it easy to speak of, uh, probably, let's say, risk in, uh, in pure quantitative terms? Or does it need some further work to make this tra easily translatable for use or adoption practice? Uh, definitely on the side of uh, adapt adoption uh, by state agencies, there needs to be a lot of communication happening and probably education uh, in the process. Uh, uh, what uh, we are planning to do, uh, the state has uh, something called a project prioritization. This is a long-term planning um, uh, tool that accounts for different perspectives. Uh, 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 mobility, safety, and so on and so forth. And our idea is that we create, uh, uh, we uh, kind of um, boil down all these uh, analyses into uh, what we call a um, resilience index. And that index would be something that weighs those values or those numbers that are being generated by the tool and becomes another decision parameter as to whether uh, a state agency will necessarily follow that or not. It's really a multitude of decisions that goes into it, but that's a, a, an extra piece of information that is provided and can be used as a, as a measure for decision-making. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have another question from the audience. Uh, so the question is, uh, as you said, Alice, also that the infrastructure systems are, so there will be always failures, but the, although the mitigation measures are implemented, so how should the resilience target uh, be set and uh, how much loss of functionality are we able or willing to accept? Uh, 
uh, in other words, how much to invest in the resilience? It really comes down to a community and a stakeholder and uh, asset owners um, uh, kind of uh, thresholds, I would say. It's um, as correctly mentioned, you correctly mentioned, uh, it's uh, uh, we do not have necessarily the resources or the knowledge to 100% um, go and mitigate everything. Uh, and um, and um, so uh, failures are going to happen. It's a, it's a part of actual, uh, and a, in a sense, uh, that's kind of what highlights importance of uh, thinking from the perspective of resilience. It's not about uh, hardening everything in such a way that nothing fails. It's about on, uh, knowing what will fail and being prepared for that and having the best strategies to recover from it. And, uh, and that, that's really what it comes down to. So yes, mitigation is very important, but uh, mitigation is really a portion of uh, resilience. From a resilience perspective, one, uh, a, a very, uh, prepared community would be one that um, understand what can fail, has plans for it, uh, has plans for it uh, to be, um, uh, in a sense, uh, recovered or repaired into a state that it wouldn't be any more vulnerable to future events of such size or such intensity. Uh, so all of that uh, is, is a definition of uh, uh, resilience. And uh, so, uh, so the idea is that and the whole reason this this um, uh, framework we have developed is um, kind of uh, um, uh, focused on the two stages and their interrelationship is really to be able to capture that uh, spectrum, full spectrum of resilience, which is not only pre-event, but also during the event and also after the event and how long it takes to recover. Uh, Alex, maybe one more question um, from the audience, uh, which is on uh, essentially the aspect of cascading effects and how this is taken into account. So this is again a question from uh, Juan Binian um, on whether the recovery simulation for the transportation system considers the interdependencies, so the cascading effect with other infrastructure networks or components, for example, uh, communication systems, electric power systems, and how? So. Well, this is a very good question, and the uh, uh, clear response would be to in this uh, in this program uh, that we have developed. No, it doesn't have interdependency. Uh, I would say the only effects that are considered are the first order effects because of damage to road or bridge segments uh, to the. Uh, transportation network itself and its users. So that's really uh, first order effect uh, uh, in the uh, consideration of resiliency, but that's right. These uh, factors are important uh, and uh, would impact how fast the recovery could happen or could take place. Uh, things such as how long it takes for debris to be cleaned up before access is granted to different parts, whether resources are available, whether crew are available, whether a material is available, uh, whether uh, the contracting process is available. All of that uh, has an impact on how fast one can recover in addition to obviously that interdependency that was mentioned, who gets to fix what first uh, in that context uh, is, uh, is an important thing. And there's some, I, we know that there's some uh, um, aspects of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, in a sense, um, uh, competing uh, interests there as well. None of that was modeled in here, and uh, it, it was it was just impossible for a huge network like this that we are modeling to consider those aspects. But one can definitely look into smaller networks uh, and um, kind of try to capture those effects mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Yeah, so just uh, so for instance, we have done similar study, but through indeed in a small, much smaller area. So, the do you take into account a flood protection system, uh, like I mean, whatever embankments, levees, and uh, what kind of failures uh, did you take into account? 
That's a very good question. Uh, and uh, in this specific study, we are assuming that the flooding level is whatever it is. Uh, so uh, what you're mentioning is uh, would be some sort of a decision output from this to create, to decrease the exposure to the system, uh, which would require some sort of dynamic uh, hydrologic analysis on the uh, flooding scenarios and flooding hazards. And we, we didn't have that capacity at the time. However, uh, that's something that is uh, being conducted now with uh, some hydrologic models that are dynamic and then capture the, uh, the potential implementation of, um, in a sense, ex exposure reducing uh, 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 measures such as flood walls, levees, and also catch basins and such. Yes, yeah. no, not included in this study, though. Thank you. Uh, Alice, I think with this, we're reaching near the end of the seminar. And as always, I want to ask you to maybe leave us your uh, message on what you would like the audience to take from this talk and this discussion. So what would be, let's say, your closing message? Uh, well, I, I wish I, <laughs> I could have prepared something for that. Uh, so I think um, any type of study that claims uh, to be conducting, being um, uh, kind of directing in towards uh, resilience, uh, uh, especially with infrastructure, needs to be um, uh, conducted in coordination, in, uh, coordination with um, real life stakeholders. Uh, when, uh, when we talk with the stakeholders uh, and asset owners as to, you know, what are, uh, what are, what is uh, keeping them awake at night in a sense, and uh, what are the aspects that they want to um, um, kind of be considered, uh, sometimes it's very different from uh, the assumptions that are uh, we're making in the academia. And uh, for these models and uh, frameworks to be useful, really uh, the best stages to, uh, the best approach is to kind of involve them early on in the communication so that what is produced is, uh, uh, is uh, useful and uh, I can uh, say that uh, we have to a large extent done that in this study and uh, as, as such we can see it to be implemented. Great, so uh, let me also remind everyone that if you would like to um, visit, uh, you can visit our webpage to catch a recording of this talk if you would like to see again some of the concepts presented uh, or of uh, previous, uh, or the talks of previous uh, speakers or previous live talks as well. Uh, Sergio, our administrative assistant has placed the link in the chat for your convenience. So we invite you to log in and also check uh, the page for our upcoming events. There will be uh, two more um, live talks that are coming up in the next uh, months, so you will find more information then. I want to thank Irina for uh, co-moderating this talk and most of all also Alice, of course, for being here today and sharing with us her exciting research, which I think will inspire many. And of course, everyone for joining in and hope to see everyone soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice.